Okay, can you hear me? Cool. Uh, okay, so that's my Twitter handle, and I'm a Spark and data science architect at Hortonworks. So uh, first of all, uh, it's great to be here uh, at the Spark Summit. Uh, it's pretty amazing to see Spark, uh, you know, has grown in popularity as well as the kind of, you know, intrins uh, intricate technology that's behind it. Uh, as uh, Michael pointed out, uh, Michael's goal is to kind of, you know, make people forget about Shark. And uh, I, I, if Renald is here, Renald and I worked a lot on Shark, so I'm actually very excited that. We have Spark SQL and Catalyst. Uh, it's way better than what we were doing uh, when we were working on Shark. Uh, so that said, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I think is a really, uh, really interesting use case for Spark SQL, uh, and uh, what really benefits from Spark SQL also, uh, which is uh, Magellan. Uh, it's a geospatial analytics library for Spark that I started putting together about a couple of months back. Uh, so I'm going to tell you kind of the motivation behind it and kind of where it is at, and maybe kind of end with a demo. Uh, you know, after the after the talk, I'm going to be at the Hortonworks booth. Uh, please come and talk to me, and uh, if you're interested in geospatial analytics, uh, I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, so first of all, to set some context, right? So what is geospatial analytics? Uh, what is uh, first of all, what is geospatial context? So uh, any point or any shape. Uh, you can attach some metadata with it, which is basically what is its surrounding, uh, you know, what is its surrounding, what is in, what is it in. For example, given a longitude and latitude, what point is it, right? Which city is, does it represent? Similarly, given a shape, does it intersect some other shape? That's a fairly basic geometric question. If it does, then what, is, what does the intersection look like, right? Uh, a more interesting question is, given a sequence of points and a system of roads, what is the best sequence of uh, what is the best chain of paths that could have been taken? So this last one is called a map matching algorithm, right? So there are geometric queries, there are spatial queries, and there are actually geometric algorithms. All all three are basically adding some kind of context to a point or a shape or a sequence of points, right? Uh, any one of these questions is a is adding geospatial context. Uh, where is it useful? So it's actually useful in a multitude of places. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, if you are uh, if you are if you are Uber, right? You might be interested in figuring out uh, based on the data, mobile data that you collect, you know what neighborhood do people frequent on weekends? You know, c can you actually do some prediction on this? So in other words, can you predict the drop-off point of a user? Right? Uh, can you predict uh, how the usage pattern will change with time? Uh, so a lot of these questions. So again, if you are a, if you are SFPD, San Francisco Police Department. Uh, you might be interested in figuring out what are the crime hotspot neighborhoods, uh, and uh, how do these hotspots evolve with time. And more interestingly, can you predict the likelihood of crime in a given neighborhood at a given point in time? Right. Uh, this is just a sampling of problems. Uh, uh, geospatial data is actually pervasive. What I mean by that is a bunch of these data sets are available for free. The U.S. government itself has put together tons of data sets. World governments are starting to make more of these data sets available for free. Uh, so there is actually a lot of data that you can take today and kind of deal with it, right? Uh, and use it in your uh, analy analytics. Uh, so this should be fantastic. What is the problem, right? And first of all, why am I talking about geospatial data now? This kind of existed for years and years, right? So I'm going to actually argue that geospatial data is truly big data, right? So what it means is there is big data in terms of the massive volume of data you have to deal with. And there is a massive volume of data people deal with today, which is mobile data, right? And uh, very many organizations are starting to collect mobile data today, but you have to put mobile data in some kind of a context. You have longitude, latitude, GPS coordinates, and you have to place a context around it and hopefully mine that context for analytics, right? And that's actually a very hard problem because geospatial analytics, by its kind of very definition, is a complex computational problem. So you have a computational complex problem along with a large amount of data you're collecting. So it's really a big data problem. And uh, with uh, due apologies to Samuel L. Jackson. So the other question is, OK, that's fantastic. This is a great problem to solve. This is the time to solve it. Why do we need one more library? Right? Uh, so I'm actually going to argue that there don't exist very many good libraries to do this. Okay? So we do actually need one more library. Okay? Uh, why is that? So first of all, let's take something super basic like parsing data. Right? This is a no-brainer. So you need to be able to parse geospatial data formats very, very easily. Okay? The problem with this is that a lot of data sets that have been released in public, for example, 
the ones that you want to take advantage of, they are in very arcane formats, very, very hard to parse. Some of them actually have gone to the extent of you know, giving you a specification for parsing out shapes, which is fantastic. But there are no specifications for passing out metadata, which is terrible, right? I cannot just take a shape and then not know what it's talking about, right? Uh, worse yet, in some cases, the metadata format is actually DBase. I don't know how many people actually know about DBase format, but it's super hard to parse. Uh, in fact, the parser I ended up writing was based on kind of hacking together, uh, looking at a bunch of C++ code from 1980s to figure out what was going on, right? Uh, so there is zero documentation on all this. Uh, that's, so that's bad. And that happens to be one of the most uh, prominent ways in which geospatial data is formatted and stored. Uh, so that's, that's terrible, right? The other thing is, uh, over the last several years, there have been better formats like GeoJSON. Uh, unfortunately, GeoJSON is verbose. Uh, but at, uh, in, on the plus side, it's actually parsable. But the flip side is it's actually not common. Not too many people use GeoJSON. The newer data sets are being available in GeoJSON format, but not, not all of them. And then there are specialized formats that uh, people do put together, but they are actually neither JSON, I mean, neither GeoJSON nor ESRI uh, shapefiles, so they don't really have a spec, and it's uh, very hard to convert from one format to another. So you end up with a lot of just parsing nightmares that you have to deal with, right? Um, so this should be like a complete no-brainer. So solving the parsing problem. The other thing is when you think about geospatial data. Today, you're collecting a lot of GPS coordinate data. That mo mo mobile data is GPS coordinates, right? But if you look at how maps are stored, the cartographic projection systems are actually very different. So they don't really store, most of the time, they don't store G GPS coordinates. They try to be more and more accurate, as accurate as possible. And those coordinate systems are very different. So on the right-hand side, there is actually a projection of a coordinate system that's called a Lambert conic. Basically, you take the sphere, and you try to project a cone on the sphere, and then unravel the cone. And that kind of gives you a two-dimensional uh, flat space, right? Uh, this coordinate system was invented by uh, Lambert, uh, who did a great job, but it's a terrible coordinate system to actually convert from and, and to. And there aren't that many parsers, uh, sorry, that many uh, transformers that can actually transform from one coordinate system to another. And again, this is something that should be super easy, super available, and uh, you, know, you shouldn't really have to think about it too much, OK? The, most important problem that I'm, I want to talk about is, uh, you know, okay, the usability is, is great, but there's also scalability, right? It's because one piece of the problem is actually, you know, it's, it's big. Mobile data is huge. So if you really want to do any kind of meaningful uh, geospatial analytics at scale, you better deal with scale, right? Uh, unfortunately, there aren't any libraries, and any, there aren't any libraries in open source that can actually do scalable geospatial analytics today. There is one that actually runs on Hadoop, but it lacks ge geospatial joins. So if you don't have spatial joins, you're not going to scale, period. No. Okay? Uh, that's one thing. There are libraries available for people who use Python. There's a few that are supported at various levels. Uh, Shapely comes to mind. It's a pretty well-written library. Uh, but it actually does not scale. It's a single process uh, algorithm, set of algorithms. Um, and there are a few proprietary engines, which I'm not going to talk about too much. Uh, but basically, it leads us to a kind of Venn diagram like this, right? So you have, on the one hand, scalability, and you have, on the other hand, I'm kind of being a little bit loose here and saying that, okay, Esri on Hive is scalable. So on the one hand, you have a scalability, and then on the other hand, you have two things that you really want as a developer or as a data scientist, right? So you want features, but you, the features are not going to cover every algorithm you want to implement, so you want extensibility. You also want something that's super simple, right? You want it, you want it to be as simple as possible. And you want it to be intuitive so that you don't have to think too hard about using the library and getting productive with it. And it should very well handle common formats so that you don't have to worry about parsing. Right? Uh, so this is kind of the space. Sorry. So this is the space where you know, uh, Magellan tries to plug the gap. But uh, before I get there, there is one other really interesting problem that uh, forced me to kind of uh, write Magellan the way I did it. And that is, I talked a little bit about geospatial context. Why is it useful? Why do you want to work with it? How to do it at scale? But that's just one step in any kind of processing. So if you think about, so here is an example. Uh, this is a real world example. This is a search advertising pipeline. So this is actually something that I was involved in. Uh, you know, at a very high level, this is what we did at Yahoo. What we did was we, we had search data. And uh, when, you, when you type a query, we want to figure out what ad should we show you, right? And if you figure out that this is the best ad to show, 
or this sequence, this three ads are the best ads to show. We run them through a marketplace, figure out which ad wins. We show that ad, right? Uh, so that's, that's basically what search advertising does. Where we came in was to figure out, given a search query and given an ad, what is the probability that the user is going to click on this ad, right? If you can kind of estimate that probability well, we are in business. Now, to estimate the probability, you kind of need features, right? So obvious features are actually what, what is the query, what is the ad title, is there kind of a similarity between the query and the ad, and so on. So there are non-obvious signals also, which is, you know, I'm, I'm typing this query on a browser, on a mobile browser, so I get to know, or, or uh, Yahoo gets to know your mobile location, right? So if I know your location, I can immediately add some context around your query. So I know what you might be talking about. For example, if you're talking about coffee and there is a Starbucks nearby, then most likely a Starbucks ad is going to be more useful to you, right? Uh, so, so in that sense, geospatial context is just one extra thing in your entire either predictive analytics or machine learning pipeline. And what I wanted to do was to not have you take all your data, put it into complete, a completely different system, analyze it, take the results, and have to join it with the rest of your pipeline. So it made a lot of sense to think about something that's actually written on top of Spark for this reason, right? Um, so I've talked about a lot of downsides about what exists today, but it's not all that bad. The situation is not really bad, right? Because A, if you're on a single process and if you're kind of only worried about local computations, there is already a good enough kind of geospatial library out there, which is open source, and you can take that and leverage it. And that's what we have done. Right? Uh, the other piece is there is already Spark that allows you to scale out computation. So you don't have to worry about how to scale computations out on a large number of nodes. And Spark al also with data frame support supports Python and R natively. And the nice thing about data frames, as uh, Michael pointed out, is that you don't compromise performance just for supporting Python and R. And this was a big deal for us because a lot of data science kind of is done with Python and R. So you want them to get the best in breed algorithms that are fast and not have to sacrifice uh, just because they want to program in a more convenient language. Right? Uh, the other piece of it from an uh, implementation perspective is that, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, is Catalyst, together with data sources and data frames, uh, allows us the flexibility as well as simplicity and performance that I was talking to you about. So we can actually get all three parts of that Venn diagram by using Catalyst intelligently. So essentially, then the recipe for success is basically stitch it all together you know, using Catalyst and so on but allow extension points so that the algorithms that we didn't think of or the algorithms we want people to contribute to are easy to contribute to. Okay? So, that, so my hope basically is that Magellan ends up being kind of the, uh, a good story for geospatial analytics. Okay? So the idea is to allow you to create geospatial analytics applications faster. So you use your favorite language if you want. You get the best in class algorithms. You write less code because uh, of data frames and because of the kind of support uh, it provides. And again, with data, data frame support and the way we do predicate pushdowns and so on, you are able to read data efficiently. You don't have to read all the data and kind of munge on it. Uh, and we let the optimizer do the heavy lifting. Uh, so this is kind of the kind of goal of Magellan. Uh, very quickly, how does this work? So you can think of it as roughly four pillars, right? Uh, first, we have custom data types that stand for shapes. So for example, today we support points, lines, polylines, polygons, and so on. And these are what you would think they are. So polygon is basically a polygon. It could have multiple holes in it and so on. The local computations are done using Esri Java API. Now, uh, the reason why we support, we, we have our own custom data types and we carefully handle the serialization and so on is that we don't really want serialization overhead. So we don't even want the Scala to SQL serialization that happens in data frames typically. And the reason is that, uh, as I mentioned, geospatial data is computationally intensive, right? So if you, want, if you have a point and if you have a shape and you want to know whether a point is inside a shape or not, that computation is, is actually not easy. And the best way to do it is to actually index your data structure. If you, if you index your shape and create an index data structure, then you want to make sure that you hold on to it and you don't kind of serialize it and deserialize it too often because then you have to recompute the index, right? So, you, so we have to be very careful about how we do this. Uh, so that's why we have our own custom data types. And of course, uh, Catalyst allows you to, uh, so Spark SQL allows you to ingest data through what's called a data source. And we have our own data sources for this. Uh, today, we support uh, both GeoJSON as well as shapefile formats. Uh, we are adding support for newer format, uh, other formats as well. But these are like the two most dominant formats in which geospatial data is available today. Uh, GeoJSON is more recent. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, evolving uh, 
kind of format. Uh, shapefile format is much older, but again, most data is available in shapefile format uh, today. Uh, the other two pillars are basically expressions. So we have literal expressions that make it simple for you to create points and polygons and so on. We have Boolean expressions for intersects, contains, and all the various common Boolean operations that you would do with spatial queries. And we also have binary expressions for things like intersection, right? Intersection of shape A and B should give you some other shape. Uh, and we stitch it all together using custom strategies uh, in Spark. So for example, we parse and evaluate expressions and figure out what to do. We look at joins and figure out whether this join can be done using a broadcast or it needs to be done using a more fancy algorithm. Uh, today, we actually support broadcast spatial join, uh, sorry, broadcast Cartesian join. Uh, but uh, very soon, we'll have support for what's called geohash join. Um, so that's kind of the overview of how Magellan works with Spark SQL. Uh, in a nutshell, if you're using Magellan, it's kind of basically the first line here is how you would read a shapefile. And we'll go into it in more detail in a, in a demo. Uh, but basically, reading a shapefile is essentially one line. Okay? Uh, reading GeoJSON is slightly more complicated than that, just because by default, we think of a, a spatial format as shapefiles. You have to tell us that the type of format is something else, which is GeoJSON. Now, spatial queries, like I said, there are shape literals. There are also Boolean expressions. The Boolean expressions, for anybody familiar with Spark SQL, is going to be very Spark SQL-like. So for example, point within polygon is just exactly how we would represent it. Point polygon 1 intersection polygon 2 is exactly how we would think of it. And an example of a join using catalysts would be something like points that join polygons, where point within polygon, right? So this is very commonsensical. It's very simple and declarative. And that's one of, one of the big advantages of Spark SQL is that you maintain declarative nature. But underneath the covers, because we know how to do the joins, and we leverage catalysts to do this intelligently, we are able to optimize this for you, right? So you don't end up doing a Cartesian product of everything and kind of munging all the data and then doing a filter, OK? So that's kind of the rough idea of how we use this with, uh, with Spark. Where are we right now? So uh, 1.0.3 is already out as a Spark package. Uh, it's hosted on GitHub. Um, there is also a blog which, should have, which came out a few days back. Uh, it's all linked on the slides, which I'll put up in my uh, uh, put up on Twitter uh, soon. And uh, there is also a Zeppelin notebook example where you can play around with uh, Magellan and kind of see what it does. Uh, I, you know, for anybody here who is interested in geospatial data, I think this is a really cool project, and it could, it could really use your help. So you know, give us feedback as to what is missing, what are the things you would really like to see, and where do you want to take this project? So uh, that feedback will be highly appreciated. What is coming next? So in about a month, we are going to be releasing a few more uh, uh, things. So one thing is basically support for Spark 1.5 and 1.6. Uh, the other one is going to be spatial join optimization, the geohash algorithms. Uh, and I discussed map matching at the very beginning, right? So we are going to add a, uh, the first algorithm for map matching, uh, which I think there is no algorithm for map matching available open source, period. So this will be very cool. And there, is, there are a few tickets to kind of add new geospatial data formats. So again, based on what the community needs the most, we'll start adding in that sequence. So that's kind of where we are. Now, uh, I'm going to kind of walk through a demo. So I was thinking I'll kind of do a, so this, this demo is going to be the following. So uh, this is very similar to the de demo that's in the blog. So you can actually go back to the blog and refer to it. Uh, but the demo is basically, we want to read some Uber data. We want to read the neighborhoods of San Francisco. And we want to do some interesting analytics and learn about the traffic flow in San Francisco based on Uber data. Okay? Now, the nice thing about this demo is that Uber actually made a data set available to us a few years back. And can you all see this? Is that clear? OK, so, uh, so there is two data sets here. One is basically the Uber data, which is basically trip ID, a timestamp, a latitude, and longitude. Okay? Uh, and keep in mind, this is basically San Francisco trips. Uh, the other one is the actual geospatial data. And this is the data of 
the neighborhoods of San Francisco. Okay? So San Francisco, for those of you who don't know, is on the west coast of the United States. Uh, and it's a beautiful city. Uh, it has about 37 odd neighborhoods. And this data set was made available by the San Francisco city. Okay? So all I did was kind of download this data set. Again, instructions on where to download the data set are available on the blog. Uh, the data set is in shapefile format, which is a very common format for uh, most US public data sets. So if I look at the way the data is stored, so this is actually not human readable, right? So it's, you can't do much with this. And th there is actually a specification booklet for how to parse this data, uh, but it's, not, it's fairly tedious to do this right. But more interestingly, that only tells you how to parse the data, right? What does each piece of the data mean? is in a separate file in a different format. And this is actually, for those of you who kind of are aware, this is dbase. This is a dbase format. Again, parsing this is super hard. So let's kind of see what Magellan does, right? So I have here a Spark notebook, uh, sorry, a Zeppelin notebook. Uh, and this demo is going to be in Scala. We'll have about seven minutes. All right. So what I'm going to do is walk through how do you read this data and kind of some interesting analytics you can do with it. Okay. So first of all, you have to do a bunch of imports. Again, some of, all of this is going to be available as a notebook if you want to kind of play around with it. And what we are going to do is, uh, as Michael mentioned, you kind of want to uh, create a schema. It makes it easy for you to manipulate your data sets. And my schema is going to be, because I'm reading Uber data set, I want a trip ID and I want a timestamp. And I'm going to also create a data structure called a point. So point is a, kind of the, most, the simplest data structure that Magellan makes available for you. It's a two-dimensional point, structureless. And you just go ahead and define a case class for that. Now, again, uh, all of this is standard Spark SQL. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a text file. This particular text file, as we saw, was basically this one, which was tab separated. So all I'm going to do is separate the tabs, split it by tabs and split out the parts. So basically, split out the trip ID, the timestamp. And I'm going to actually collect the third and fourth part. And I'm going to put it in as longitude first, latitude next. This is very standard in geospatial data formats, which is your x and y coordinates are basically longitude and latitude. Okay? In my case, they are GPS coordinates. So let's actually see how this looks like. How, how does this data look like? So when I run, run this command, by the way, on the back end, there is actually some Spark code that runs, which is, you can see here. OK. So now let's go back. OK, so I've just outputted three, three lines here. So I have the trip ID, the timestamp, and the point. And now that data set by itself is not too interesting, right? So what I'm going to do is essentially try to attach for each point what is the neighborhood it's in. OK, so let's actually do that. So this is kind of how you would read a shapefile in Magellan. So this piece is very standard Spark. Oh, sorry, actually, this whole piece is very standard Spark SQL. The only difference is you're telling it what uh, data source to use, and you're telling it where the location of that file system is, and you're telling it what do you need out of this. So what columns do you need? Okay. So I'm asking it to pick the polygon, which is the sh uh, shape of a neighborhood. I'm also asking you to pick the metadata. Okay? And I'm going to end up caching this data set because it's fairly small. So like I said, there's only 37 neighborhoods. So one side of this data set is actually small. Right? The other side could be very big it could, you know, be, because it's all Uber data set. So let's actually see what's in here. OK, so I actually printed out three lines of this. So basically, we are printing out a shape, and we are printing out the metadata. Now, the shape is represented as a polygon in Magellan. There is an ID which you don't really have to worry about. This is an internal ID for kind of what this stands for. And a polygon in, in typical geospatial analytics could actually be a polygon with holes in it. So if it has more than one hole in it, there is going to be a bunch of, this array is going to have size more than one. And that's going to basically tell you where the holes start. Right? Otherwise, you end up with a sequence of points. Right? You, you can think of a polygon as just a sequence of points. Right? And interestingly enough, if you look at this data, these don't look like GPS coordinates, right? This kind of looks weird. And if I go ahead and try to join this data set, oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, remember that we, we are able to read both the data as well as the metadata. So the metadata we read as a map. 
So you can actually explode that map using standard Spark SQL and kind of see what does it look like. Okay? So in this case, the metadata basically has only one key, and it has different values. The values basically stand for the name of the neighborhood. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is take the neighborhood data, take the Uber data set, just join it. And my join key is, obviously, there's no key. right? So basically, what I have to do is I have to look for each point on, the, on one side on the Uber data set, figure out where does it lie within the neighborhood data set. Right? So this looks like an expensive join. So this is basically a Cartesian product. Right? And I'm going to kind of dump the output to see what, what does it print. OK, so this doesn't look good. Basically, it says I, I didn't find anything. right? And there is a reason for that. Going back to what we saw here, this, you know, this doesn't look like GPS coordinates. So if you're trying to, you know, if you use one coordinate system for the left-hand side and another coordinate system for the right-hand side, most likely you're not going to get anything meaningful, right? Now, the first thing we have to do is to transform coordinates. Remember, transforming coordinates is not easy because you have to figure out how do you do a conical projection, how do you kind of unravel that projection, and so on. So Magellan actually does this for you. And in this case, I have to do one more thing because I'm in the US, and everything is measured in terms of feet there. So I have to do multiply by 3.2. So I kind of did that as well. Uh, and you get a transformer. So basically, a transformer is something that, take, given a point, gives you another point. Right? Now I can use Spark SQL again. Instead of having points in GPS coordinate systems, now I'm going to create a new coordinate system and just add an extra column. Okay? And now let's do the join. And let's kind of, by the way, at this point, nothing has actually happened. This is just a delayed execution, as uh, Michael was pointing out. When you actually want to execute this, when you actually do execute an action, that's when something happens. So you do see that now, in instead of this, where you got nothing back, you're actually getting something back. So each of the trips actually have a neighborhood. This is great, right? So we are in business. Now let's actually go and do something interesting. So what I'm going to do here is, now that we are able to attach the neighborhood as a context to every point, I'm going to kind of group by the neighborhood and figure out how many distinct trips actually pass through a given neighborhood. Right? So this would be interesting just from the point of view of what is the most popular neighborhood. Right? So this is actually you know, this is a query that will take about 20 seconds or so. And you can actually see what's happening here. Basically, there is a two-stage query that runs. And uh, you know, when, 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 the, when this thing is done, we're going to get an output here. OK, so this is good. So basically, we see that, again, if you're not familiar with the neighborhoods, uh, no worries. Basically, so south of market is what's called Soma. And it's, it's a very popular up-and-coming up neighborhood in San Francisco. And you can kind of see that, yeah, there are more trips there, more trips that go through Soma than the rest. This is actually not the best visualization for this. So let me actually pull up a pie chart where you can kind of see, you know what? Yeah, so Soma does have you know, more trips passing through it. Uh, let's do something else, which is I'm not so interested in trips passing through Soma as trips starting from a given neighborhood. right? So I do a little bit of Spark SQL magic. And I can, again, kind of do a bit of analysis. OK, I'm running out of time. All right, let's try to get this done in 36 seconds. My countdown is 36 seconds. OK, cool. So I've added a start timestamp, start neighborhood, end timestamp, and end neighborhood. Right Now I'm going to basically group by start neighborhood and figure out how many trips started in a given neighborhood. OK, this is cool. So there's basically about 5,600 trips that started from Soma. So that's actually pretty big, right? So I can already see that Soma and like three, four neighborhoods of San Francisco account for 80% of all the trips. So this is really cool. Let's actually look at something more interesting, which is starting from Soma, where do trips actually end? All right, this is really cool. So most trips that start in Soma actually end in Soma. Uh, so this, this is really interesting, right? Okay. It's like most, you know, most things that happen in Soma kind of stay in Soma. All right. So I, I told you, so what you saw was a kind of demo of how Magellan is useful and kind of how easy it is to get started with it. But here is an example of how we use Catalyst, right? So for example, it's very simple for you to describe what geometric query you want to do. But here, the optimized physical plan uses broadcast Cartesian join. 
And it uses that today because one of the tables is small. Now, in about a month's time, when we actually are ready with uh, the new spatial join algorithm, we will end up, if, if you go to a much bigger uh, neighborhood data set, you may not even notice it, but you will see that the right join gets picked up once the new join is available. So under the covers, there's a lot of optimizations that we can do without you having to worry about any of that, right? So that's one of the big advantages of using Catalyst and Spark SQL. Uh, so I think that ends my demo, and that kind of ends what I wanted to talk about. Uh, if there are any questions, you know, we can take, take them. So we'll take one question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hello. This is a very interesting demonstration. I wonder if uh, on the on the issue of uh, importing uh, fi uh, formats, you have exporting formats as well, because eventually uh, the need would require that feature. No. So remember that this is not a library for uh, building geospatial formats. This is a library for doing analytics with it. You can export any data you want using, cattle, using data frames and Spark SQL already. So you don't have to do anything different. So let's say you've done all this analysis, and then you want to dump the output use, you know, into uh, you know, ARC format or Parquet or whatever it is. That's up to you. We are not involved. But we don't allow, you know, it's not the goal of this project to allow you to kind of export uh, shape files and all that. That's, that's not the goal of Magellan. I mean, it's, it's definitely good to have, but it's, it's outside the scope. Yeah. OK, thank you, Ram. So it's currently lunchtime. Uh, we'll meet back here at 1.50, which is in uh, more than an hour. Thank you.